Okay, now it's day one. It's the Fully Live Athlete Pastor channel. Justin here. I'm back with you. Now, we're going to be reading today in the, in, the, in the plan, which is posted below, Genesis 1 through 3 and Matthew 1. We're going to be reading a little Old Testament, a little New Testament, a little more old than new. And we want to see that they do fit together very well. As you look at the beginning of the Old Testament, uh, you see that it starts out with just a declaration that God exists. In the beginning, God. And he creates. And so you look at chapter 1, the quick and dirty summary of it is he creates three domains in the first three days out of, out of nothing, uh, just by his very voice. And then the fourth through sixth day, he creates uh, inhabitants of those domains. So uh, he creates the heavens and earth. Then he creates the, two, the greater and the lesser light. Uh, so one and four parallel, two and five, you got the sea and then the sea creatures. Uh, and you got day uh, three and six parallel with the uh, the land, and you've got the animals and man created on the sixth day there. So three and six parallel too. It's it's majestic. It's it's symmetrical. It's a description of of God's creating all things out of nothing. You know, before anything existed, there was just God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, existing in ever loving fellowship, and He creates in order to extend fellowship and love and participation in that to creatures like us. And particularly the thing that highlight that you really got to highlight in Genesis one as you read it is this poetic. It's set apart in in my Bible here, uh, but if you look at it, it says that verse twenty seven. So God created man in His own image, in image of God He created them, male and female He created them. I could spend my whole life discovering what that means and never exhaust the end of it. That we we as people are created in the image of God. So as you think about uh, there's old old. Puritan work called the fourfold state of man, which it unpacks this in like hundreds of pages, uh, what that means. But we are God's image bearers, and that Adam here was made to be this true king, to to reign over the earth. It says there in twenty eight that would, that he is to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over all of the creatures of that earth. He's given him all these things to enjoy, right? For food, he's providing for him, and he rested from all that creation because he's made a king to represent him, to image him on this earth. His creation is very good, and you see in Genesis two the drama and the tension in Genesis two is that Adam's alone, and so God creates a helper because if God's going to really have an image bearer, and God is three persons, one God, he needs two image bearers. He needs two to relate to one another as he relates to the other within himself. He's one God, but three persons. And so he makes one image bearer, man, male and female, uh, to complement, to help one another. And so he, he creates a helper for Adam who's alone, a suitable helpmate, as they call him. Uh, so Eve is created. And then Adam is given this commission prior to the creation of Eve to, to subdue the earth, fulfill it, or fill it, as we said earlier, but there's one caveat, there's a prohibition, there's, or there's one prohibition, there's one command, and it's called, the, we call it the covenant of works in Reformed theology. And that is that Adam was to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the day eight of it, he should surely die. That's 2.15 2, through 17 there. He should surely die. So go look that up as you're, as you're reading through it and highlight that. That's the covenant of works. Well... We know in Genesis 3 that he doesn't keep that. In fact, uh, the man and woman who are, are highlighted as being naked and unashamed, everything's great, they're in the fellowship and presence of God. Well, the serpent comes in the next 3-1 and wreaks havoc on creation because he causes Adam and Eve first to distrust God's goodness and to distrust God's word and to rely upon another word a rival interpretation of creation. And so that's that's the beginning of the end for God's relationship with his creatures through Adam. What happens is a summary judgment on all of creation. Adam's action of eating and disobeying God brought all of creation into sin and misery. Think about that. One man brought all of creation into an estate of sin and misery. Yeah. Did you know that one man also brings people from all 
the earth and all the world into a state of salvation? Yeah, Jesus. Isn't that amazing, the parallelism in the, in the two men? In fact, in Romans 5, Jesus is called the second man or the second Adam. Did you know that? Isn't that amazing that the very beginning of the Bible sets up this uh, contrast between Christ and Adam? Adam is the first image bearer. He was to be a king. He was to rule over the creation and extend this garden out to all the all of creation, right? Extend God's dominion out there. Show forth that. But then he's also called to be a priest and defend it. He didn't defend it. He didn't defend it at all. Like he let the he let the enemy run wild in there. And then he's supposed to be the prophet. He's supposed to reveal God's will for all the people. So you think about that. Adam failed miserably. And in Reformed theology, we believe that Christ fulfills all of those roles as the true and second Adam, the second man. And you see that? That's how we would be called justified or righteous, is that none of us measure up to the standard. None of us have been unfaithful to God's command for us. We've disobeyed it. We've become sinners, right? Just like Adam. We inherited this from Adam, actually. But the second Adam, Christ, brings us into a state of salvation. And you know what? That was all, all, all put together in seed form in Genesis 3.15. Look, look at it. The woman, to the woman, or to the serpent, he says in 3.15, there's gonna, the offspring of you and the offspring of the woman are going to be in conflict, right? There's going to be enmity or hostility between them. Your offspring is going to bruise the heel of the woman's offspring, but the woman's offspring is going to crush the head of the serpent or bruise the head of the serpent. So that's the end, really, of this story. Is it sets out good, creation's good. Uh, there's a need for a helper in Genesis 2. But Genesis 3 brings the tension that will not be resolved until Christ comes and, and fulfills Adam's role in keeping the entire covenant of works. Uh, and this is what we call the covenant of grace. That the covenant of works will be fulfilled to, uh, to be the righteousness of God's people. And to uh, make atonement for the breaking of this through his own death on the cross. And that by faith we could be accounted righteous. So that's the whole setting up of the rest of the unfolding of this covenant. The covenant of grace in Genesis 1-3. through 3. What do you see when you turn over to Matthew chapter 1? What do you see in Matthew chapter 1? It starts off, interestingly enough, in a genealogy. And you think, well this is boring. The first 17 verses are just genealogy. You look at it and you're like, man, this, this, this is a uh, you know, very, very uh, you know, boring reading. But you think about it, uh, it makes sense because a king's validity goes back to their lineage. And you see the major players of the Old Testament, Abraham and David there, who, who are pictured as these the, the, the big king and the big father of our faith here, Abraham and David and Jesus, descends from them. and Because the promise in 2 Samuel 7.14, which is a further explanation of Genesis 3.15, is that David's throne or his descendant would reign forever. We know in the Old Testament, we're going to read that it doesn't last like that. That the, that the throne doesn't, reign, doesn't last forever. In fact, the people of God are under dominion of another nation at the time when Jesus is born. And we'll figure out how that all happens as we read through it. But like, that's not the idea. It's not the natural descendant necessarily. Uh, it is because Jesus is the natural descendant. But he needs to also be born of God. And so you see the birth of Jesus uh, takes place in this way in verse 18. He's not just like every other person who's come along uh, and has become a sinner but he would be born of Mary and Joseph. And in, and in verse 18, which is a key verse, he, he's, he's uh, found, Mary is found to be of child, or with child, from the Holy Spirit. It says he's conceived, in verse 20, by the Holy Spirit. And you're going to call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so it had to be that this child would be born, Jesus, who would be, miraculously born by the Holy Spirit, but also be of the right lineage, true human, 
and true son of God. It, com- it connects together. The offspring theme that we saw in Genesis 3 is right there at the heart in the beginning of Genesis or Matthew 1, the beginning of the gospel. So that's day one. As you're reading it, it goes all together. The whole story goes together. There's going to be a king who would come, a, a prophet, a priest, Jesus, who would rescue his people from their sins. And that's exactly what Genesis 3.15 promises. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed this little recap of Genesis 1-3 through and Matthew 1. Or it might be a precap for you uh, as you get into reading the, the first few chapters of your reading plan. But if you've got comments, if you've got questions, just put them below. I'll try to respond to all of them if I can. And uh, make sure you hit subscribe at the button here underneath here, the, the bell. Like the channel, please. Subscribe so we can get the word out there. Because our, our resolution this year is to get as many people as possible reading the Bible. All right. Hopefully you enjoyed this one. We'll see you tomorrow.